earlier this year, a Stanford lecturer said that uh, within 13 years, we're likely to see that we're going to be driving around in autonomous electric vehicles. Not only cars, but big trucks, uh, vans. Um, Elon Musk is already planning how to handle long haul road transport for North America. And this is going to be a very disruptive period for the world as we know it. Three new technologies are converging and in the sort of 2030, 2040 timescale, they're going to come together and they're going to create a very disruptive age of new technology. Now, I'm probably not going to see much of that. I'm three quarters of the way through my engineering career, but it's the younger generation, it's the millennials born 17, 18 years ago, that they are going to be the engineers that have to deal with those technologies. So we're going to see electrification, we're going to see enhanced storage of uh, photovoltaic energy, and this is going to be mixed in with teraflop computers. And so we're going to need engineers that are going to be able to handle those disciplines. So how are we best going to educate that generation to be able to cope with those technologies? Are they going to get a sort of traditional education like we enjoyed, which was sitting in lecture halls and learning about Boolean logic and Carnot maps? Or is accompanying the aforementioned disruptive technologies, is there going to be a disruption in the way that we educate? And the question that I'm asking at the moment is, do we continue to give a traditional education or is there going to be a revolution in how we teach digital systems? Do we stop wiring things up and do we leave it all to hardware description languages? So, <clears throat> What I'd like to do is review some of the things that we used to do and then point to some of the things that we may do in the future. And I'll leave it to you to sort of think this through and see what you think, okay? So um, I call this CS101. That's uh, Computer Simplif Computers Simplified 5. Um, so, uh, Computers are the most complex machines on the planet. Um, there's two yardsticks for this. You've got transistor count, and you've got millions of lines of code. And uh, I've listed a few machines from the past, and um, some very early machines that were right there at the forefront of the British computer industry. And then moving through the decades, we've got the 6502 that's 42 years old now. Um, <clears throat> within a year, the Z80 had uh, more than doubled the transistor count. And then from that point on, we reached a billion transistors in 2013 and allegedly 10 billion by 2015. So, um, <clears throat> Clearly, we're on this uh, exponential path um, of putting more and more transistors into silicon, but how long can that go on? The second yardstick is lines of code, and I've just listed a couple of examples there. Um, there's a very nice graphic if you type in millions of lines of code, and it tells you some of the major technology projects over the last decades and roughly how many millions of lines of code there were. Okay, so computers are extremely sophisticated. We need to break them down into simple systems so that we can educate young students um, how they work. So last year I also did a talk here about an educational theme and 
You may remember I pointed out this book by Noam Neeson and Shimon Shotsky, Shokin rather, and uh, it follows the development of a modern yet simple CPU. Uh, it goes through the hardware processes and uh, it creates um, a very simple load store architecture, 16-bit CPU that's nicknamed Hack. Now, the learning resource materials are very good. There's simulations written in JavaScript, so they can run on many platforms. But the one thing it does lack is real hardware. So I got thinking about this um, a couple of years ago, and I thought, well, is there any way in which we could produce some real hardware to accompany this um, online learning course? So let's go right back to the mid-60s. Uh, this is diode transistor logic. Um, the example is a two-input NAND gate. It's made from uh, three diodes, two resistors, and a transistor. And the NAND gate is the fundamental building block of all digital logic systems, both combinatorial and sequential. Um, Computers in the mid-60s uh, were made out of transistors and diodes. And transistors at that time were very expensive, um, about the equivalent of 10 or $15 at today's prices. And yet diodes were really quite cheap. So the logic designers of that age, they chose to use as many diodes as they could and as few transistors as they could. So... Um, uh, the rate of operation of this circuit is, was restricted to maybe one or two megahertz. So computers in the mid-60s typically used diode transistor logic, and one classic example is the Apollo guidance computer that used um, a more integrated form of this. There were three, three input NOR gates on a... Uh, on, a, on a single uh, die. And the Apollo guidance computer used three and a half thousand of these early integrated circuits. Uh, and that went to the moon on several missions. And it was also used as a, uh, a flight uh, navigation computer in certain military aircraft. If we move on, um, teaching you to suck eggs, clearly you can synthesize all the major logic families fr uh, uh, functions from uh, two input NANs. Um, that's all the usual suspects. And then you can build useful blocks like two input multiplexes, where you can select either signal A or signal B. Um, this is all fairly elementary stuff, I hope, to most people. Then we have the problem of adding binary numbers. And we have a full adder circuit there. It's made out of two half adders. And a half adder is basically an exclusive OR configuration, which is the four NANDs arranged in the grouping that you see there, um, plus an extra NAND gate to to bring in the carry-in and the carry-outs. Um, moving on to uh, sequential logic, uh, we have the, the D-type flip-flop. Um, D-type flip-flop uh, has two cross-coupled NANs. That's what characterizes it. And it has two stable states. Um, so as well as the two flip-flop, uh, sorry, the two NAND elements there, we need to have a means to be able to clock those. And the front end is a two-input multiplexer, which is the means to either feed the, the output back in again, so it will persist and it will act as a register, or to bring a new signal in. So it's about nine gates to build a, a clock D-type flip-flop. And if we think of, as bare minimum, all of these gates are one transistor and three diodes. Um, 
Now, diode transistor logic, it had a secret weapon. Um, you could get the OR function very easily from um, uh, just adding extra diodes to the, uh, the, the input, the base of, of the transistors. But because the, uh, the collectors were essentially open collector, you could take two signals and you could AND them together. So you could kind of do away without having to have an, an, extra, uh, an extra NAND on the output of two signals that you wanted to AND together. So this all helped to reduce the amount of logic that you needed. OK, but uh, if you're building a computer, the, the transistors very soon add up, and that's a list of um, how many you need for some simple structures that you'd find in, uh, in, in a CPU. Um, you could build a computer out of transistors and diodes if you wanted. Uh, several people have. Um, it's one of these things which I might say is don't try this at home. Uh, it will turn into a, into a serious project. But there are those who have, and um, there are some quite interesting examples of, uh, of those scattered around the, around the net. Now, the one example that I quote is the, the PDP-8, uh, um, 1965. That was a 12-bit computer. Um, it used uh, just over 10,000 diodes and about one-sixth of that number of transistors uh, in order to implement its architecture. OK, so here is the accumulator bit slice of a PDP-8, and this is a classic case of the draftsman being told to, I don't care how you do it, just get it all on the one sheet. Um, right in the middle at the top, uh, you see the cross-coupled uh, transistors which forms the accumulator register. That's the flip-flop in it. And the six or seven transistors down the bottom, I believe that they are implementing an exclusive OR, so, uh, or two exclusive ORs. So this is an, an adder followed by a register. But I've got the transistor and diode count there, and you see that it's about 10 to 1. So um, in the PDP-8, they needed 13 of these. There were 12 to do the addition, and then there was one for the... Uh, one for the carry. Um, and also using the bit slice technique, they, um, they implemented the, uh, the memory address, the memory data uh, registers, and also the program counter. And if you look carefully at this, you will see uh, three very characteristically cross-coupled transistors that are the register storage element, plus some additional um, uh, logic to, in the case of the program counter, to add one every time, which I think you just, believe, you just need a half adder to do that, and some way of jamming the program counter with the next count uh, of where you want to jump to. OK, um, this is an iconic uh, photograph taken sometime in the late 60s. At that time, the PDP-8 was $18,000. And uh, the, the car that the, the very nice lady is driving in, uh, that was about a tenth of that price. So it, this, this was a computer that over the decades sold somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 units. But over that time, it, it was successively, um, it was successively uh, redone using the new logic as that logic family became available. And ultimately, by the mid-1980s, the PDP-8 was reduced to a, um, a VLSI plug-in DIP chip. OK, moving on. So if you want to build a simple CPU, you need certain building blocks. Uh, we have the arithmetic logic unit, the program counter, um, a register that stores the output of the ALU so it can be reused for the next operation, an address register which can be used to um, 
to force the program counter to the next jump. And then you need some sort of control unit to synchronize everything so that it works in the same way that an engine works. So um, going back to the NAND to Tetris uh, course, as I mentioned, this is an outline of the, the hack CPU. And it shows how those various elements are connected together by basically a, a, a data bus. And uh, you see the function of the address register that can jam the, jam the program counter and provide an address into the ALU. So you can modify addresses. So the aha moment comes when you think we've got the interaction of an ALU, a program counter, and some memory. And this is all being fed by code. And um, it took me about 30 years to, to come up with this diagram <laughs> when I thought about it. OK. so. Supposing I did want to implement the hack computer as a bit slice. Well, that's one bit slice. Uh, the top stretch is the ALU. Then we've got three registers. And the bottom one is a program counter. So there are something like 80 NAND gates there. And remember, for a 16-bit computer, we need 16 of these. So that's 1,280 NAND gates. That is that on a... 50 by 50 millimeter board, but implemented in standard um, HC TTL. Doable, but a little bit tight. And here, just to show you the extent of it, that's 16 two input NAND gates on a package that's the size of a 40 pin dip. So this is the, don't do this at home, please. <laughs> it's probably not worth it. So last year, this came out. And this is the Monster 6502, where a team somewhere in North America had recreated uh, a 6502 to the closest uh, reapproximation of the original logic using just over 3,200 transistors. And this actually runs 6502 code. It runs at about 1 16th of its original clock speed, so it's about 60 kilohertz rather than 1 megahertz. But it does actually work. And as well as the uh, 3,200 transistors that are directly implementing the 6502 core, they put lots of nice colored LEDs on it. So as this executes instructions, you can see bits of the LEDs light up. And uh, interesting in its own right, but they don't plan on making any more. OK, so the 6502 is historically significant because it appeared in September of 1975, and it appeared at a price which was one-sixth of the nearest competition. So um, everybody rushed out and bought them, including Steve Wozniak from Apple. And uh, it had been designed by a very small team who were only eight people. They were a breakaway from Motorola. Uh, they got sued by Mo Motorola for having designs that were too close to what Motorola had done. In other words, the 6800 and the 6809. Um, it was very simple. It was designed to fit onto the smallest possible die size. Um, approximately four by four millimeters. And the reason for that is that the smaller the die, the more you could get on the, uh, on the wafer. And it meant that your yield would be much higher. And with a high yield, they could lower the cost. So um, it went into Commodore computers, Apple, Atari, Acorn, Auric, uh, many more. And it's been widely co copied over the, the decades, uh, improved, um, upgraded in speed, and it's also available as an FPGA soft core. So here we have an FPGA board. 
And uh, this is news just hot off the press. Uh, that's a 6502 implementing the boot up screen of an Acorn Atom. And uh, the FPGA is supplying all the signals for the VGA. I know it doesn't quite say Acorn Atom there yet, but it's still booting up. So um, here we do the open source hardware plug. Um, last year, you may remember, we featured the, the MyStorm uh, FPGA. Um, it, uh, there are now, a year on, there are several ICE 40 based open hardware FPGA boards available, along with Clifford Wolf's project ICE Storm open source toolchain. And um, the amount of online tutorial information and worked examples is increasing. And there's now a strong community group, uh, particularly in Spain. And FPGAs are becoming the new Arduino for makers and enthusiasts. And so with the hardware description language, there's a whole new, dare I say, fun way of creating complex digital designs that doesn't involve a lot of soldering of bits together. So perhaps now we are seeing the, the chasm opening up between the old way and the new way. So um, things that you can do on, a CPU, uh, on an FPGA, music synthesis, retro computing architectures, and experimental processor designs. Here's another few screens from the Acorn Atom implementation. Uh, this work was by David Banks, who is part of a forum called NECPU.org. And he had a, a very busy weekend last weekend. OK, so um, you take your FPGA board and you add a, a, a very low cost VGA adapter and wire a PS2 keyboard straight in and you have yourself a computer system. Okay, so one of the other themes running this week is EDSAC, um, which was the 1949 machine implemented at Cambridge University. Now, it used 3,000 valves, thereabouts. Uh, it ran only 18 instructions, of which arguably only about 16 were useful. And it did, it did 600 instructions per second. Now, that might seem quite slow, but compared to the mechanical desk calculators of that time, it was 150 times the speed. So can we learn anything from this ancient machine and maybe apply that and get some ideas of how we can possibly develop new CPUs that are simple in hardware, in their instruction set and architecture, and many of them could be implemented on the fabric of, a, of an FPGA. So there's the instruction set, and the one thing that I took from this when I first looked at it was that all of the instructions are given a capital letter, which some of them are fairly mnemonic in their representation. So uh, this got me thinking. And um, 25 years ago, Charles Moore of, uh, of uh, he was the creator of the fourth language. He felt that he'd done everything he could do with fourth running on other people's hardware. So he wanted to try and introduce a new class of fourth processor that used a minimum instruction set, but those instructions were tailored specifically to execute fourth. So he came up with this idea of the, the MISC, the minimum instruction set computer, where typically you would have somewhere between 25 and 32 instructions. And it was a case of picking those instructions and implementing them in hardware so that they could execute the fourth primitives. And if you've got primitive instructions, you can always put a few of them together and build up more complex um, 
instructions. With fewer instructions, you need less hardware. Uh, it's cheaper, it's simpler, faster usually, and easier to understand. And Charles Moore has gone on to create the Green Arrays processor, um, where on a single chip, he's got 144 array of very simple MISC processors. Okay, so if you were building a fourth processor, um, you would pick um, a bunch of instructions which do fourth-like things. And uh, the, the main thing that uh, uh, highlights a fourth um, um, stack-based architecture is that you need instructions to manipulate the stack. And those stack instructions are on the third row, so push, pop, do, drop, swap, over a knob and three lines up from the bottom where you've got um, uh, a couple of register shifting uh, commands, one to load the stack into the, uh, to the return stack and the other to get the return stack register back onto the, the normal stack. Stack machines are a whole class of uh, computer architecture. Uh, there's a really good book by Philip Koopman called Stack Computers, the New Wave, about 20 years old, but there's some good information there. So I got thinking about, well, EDSAC used, it, used um, capital letters to make its instructions memorable. And so I thought, well, maybe I could use single ASCII characters to make this proposed uh, simple CPU instruction memorable. And rather than writing in assembler, you write in symbols that represent the mnemonics. And this is an idea that I've been developing for a number of years. And I call it simple, which is the serial interpreted minimal programming language. And it's fourth-like. It uses single characters for command words. And you can build a simple interpreter in very much less than a K, a kilobyte of, of memory. And you can port it to virtually any MCU. And you don't need an IDE. You just write using TerraTerm. Uh, on a 16 megahertz AVR, uh, this must have been the, uh, the Arduino implementation, um, it it ran its virtual instructions at about one microsecond. Um, so these are simple instructions rather than the low-level machine code. And I have referred to it as a language, but it's more actually like a useful toolkit which allows you to exercise new hardware and to check that it's working and um, make sure that your GPIO is working and then being able to string bits of simple code together to, uh, to, to do simple applications on new hardware. Um, so I sort of thought of it as a development tool to be able to explore some of these new CPUs that I believe that now we have the right tool set to go out and create on FPGAs. Uh, the simple interpreter, I'll just rattle through it. It reads a character. It says, is it a colon? Um, if it is, it stores it into uh, one section of memory. Otherwise, it interprets it directly. It looks to see if it's an alpha character, a jump, or a number, and it interprets each of those separately. And if it's one of the primitives, like and, xor, add, or multiply, it goes off and executes a block of code and then goes back and reads the first character. I'm hoping that I'll be able to demo some of this tomorrow um, so there'll be more time to ask about some of this. Okay, so we've effectively reduced machine language to a series of human readable single ASCII characters um, inspired by EDSAC and why this is useful, so many of our benchtop um, manufacturing machines, 3D printers, um, CNC router millers, 
these basically just follow lists of instructions. And with a simple processor, you can get, a, you can get it to interpret these instructions from a file and control simple benchtop machines in the same way that we've been doing with G-code and various from years gone by. So I'm out of time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, here's another shot of EdSAC with uh, its creator, Morris Wilkes and uh, Bill Rennick, I think that is. Okay, thank you. <laughs>